Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Halverson, as you can see from the screen there. Um, I have lots of different titles at Wells Fargo, head of operations, head of support and services. Basically, on the gateway, I manage everything other than our API product group. And my partner in crime, who uh, more often than not uh, does these presentations at conferences, um, who lives here in San Francisco, could conveniently pop over, but decided about two weeks ago that um, he needed to get back to his Italian heritage and is now off sipping Negronis on the you know, Piazza Navona in Rome. So you get me, the operations guy, hopefully I don't bore everybody too terribly to death, but um, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, about two and a half years ago, uh, we were thinking about, we being the executive leadership team at Wells Fargo, we were invited to a conversation with our CFO and our CTO, we're start starting to think about our distribution path, what's going on in the marketplace. FinTech customers ours were coming to us saying, hey, we love your solutions that you have today, which are basically web-based for us. But we're starting to think about efficiency. We're starting to think about, could we stay within our ERP and do different functions that are banking related? Um, consumers were certainly you know, um, up in arms all over Europe. You know, when we talk about things like PSD2 and making their information available, we've certainly had um, some very uh, you know, uh, thoughtful you know, developers coming to us saying, hey, I'd like to have access to my information. Okay, so we're thinking about this that's happening, and then you start looking at some statistics like you see in this chart on the left, right? And this is probably not a surprise to most people in this room, right? But all of us are spending more and more time, you know, online doing things, on our phones, doing things on our tablets. You know, this, this graph really represents that logarithmic growth, right, that you go back to 2000, I believe, yep. We were spending a little over an hour a day, you know, per week, you know, on, online. It's probably hard to imagine that we only spent that little bit of, of time. You know, fast forward to 2016, and now we're spending, you know, almost an entire day per week. And that was 2016. I'm sure if you extrapolate out to 2018, it's probably four times that now, right? You know, it makes you wonder how we even find time to sleep and go to school or go to work, right, with all the time we're spending online. So what are people doing with all this time that they're online? Well, if you look at that little graph on the right, we know what they're not doing. They're not spending a lot of time browsing financial services. Why is that, right? When we know that a lot of that time people are spending online is doing e-commerce, right? Making payments to each other, setting up savings plans, right? Um, doing things uh, that are all very financially related, but they're not doing them on our static locations. So, when we think about what, you know, when we, the title of this presentation is a skate to where the puck will be, keeping that thought in mind of where everybody's going was really kind of our overriding theme then for thinking about the gateway. And of course, skating where the puck will be is not m a phrase I came up with. Does anyone know who came up with that, right? The, the great one, Wayne Gretzky, uh, who is probably by far the Canadian or Canada's best philosopher of all things. Um, and I, I kind of thought this was a, a good title. I was telling some folks earlier today, about a year ago, I moved to Charlotte from Minneapolis. And everybody literally that I run into that's a native Charlottean, which is hard to find because most people are transplants, think I'm Canadian. So I'm like, well, I might as well reference Wayne Gretzky, the greatest of all Canadians, right? So keeping all that stuff in our back of our minds, right, of uh, where people are spending their time, why are they not spending that time, you know, uh, doing financial services stuff, it really brought to mind our existing distribution channel. And if we're trying to do the right thing for our customers, we should be thinking about where they're at. You know, when the banking first got started, it was all about branches. And then we got, you know, really creative and brought the telephone into the, the you know, the queue of things. And then of course, the, you know, the ATM machine at the time seemed like that was gonna solve all the world's problems when it came to accessibility for banking. And then in the 90s, you saw the advent of online banking. And of course, you know, everybody's on their phones nowadays. It only seemed to make sense that if we're thinking about where our customers are, that really the Wells Fargo Gateway should be there to deliver products and services to our customers in the digital experience of their choice, not one of our choosing. Because if you think about all those other distribution channels, those are our choices, right? Wells Fargo developed all of those bricks and mortar locations or those online presences, and we need people to go to one of those to interact with us. What if we could interact with them in the experience that they were already in? And we really wanted to do this not just for a particular line of business at Wells Fargo, because our old operating mentality was really, you know, run it like you own it, and people develop technology within their line of business without really thinking about, can I connect to anything else? We have over 90 lines of business at Wells Fargo. If we continue to go down this path of, well, we'll build the gateway for wholesale banking, but we'll leave retail customers on their own, we'll leave you know, financial institutions uh, you know, separate from that. We said, nope, this is an enterprise platform. We'll have one API, one customer-facing API gateway that will solve all the world's problems and deliver financial services before you even think about them. 
All right, so great idea. Now we want to have a gateway. We want to be able to provide APIs you know, to our customers all across the world, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Great. How do you do that? So four of us got together. It was me, my, my manager at the time, some other guy, the guy that I mentioned that was, is now in Rome having a good time, and another guy, our chief architect, that you know, we'd never been together in the same room before. We're like, you know, we need to get together and really think about what's our strategy? How are we going to pull this off? And you know, my manager, who's a, a big time Vegas guy, he's like, well, the only place to go to be creative is Vegas. And we're like, I don't know about that, but you know, okay, fine. You know, no, nobody was really complaining. So literally the four of us flew off the next day after we got board approval with our seed funding to, to kick off the gateway, flew out to Vegas. Um, and I don't know, somebody read an article somewhere about you, know, you should never have a group of people together doing development work that's, you know, can't be serviced by two boxes of pizza. Um, so we decided to you know, have fun and, and ate, ate pizza. We're going to have pizza for lunch every day. We made it to day three and said, that's enough damn pizza. Um, but really, I think you know, we were really super excited. We, we really knew what we needed to do. I think we thought we were all super smart too. And we walked away at the end of that meeting going, we don't know a damn thing. We better go start talking to some people and figure out what's going on. Because there really, before we got started with this, there was no large US bank in this country that had an API platform. So we started talking to banks in Europe. We talked to some banks in Southeast Asia. We talked to a couple different companies here in the U.S. that had built API platforms, some of which were being hosted also by WSO2 because even though Rick's a really great guy and we talked to some other people at WSO2, we needed to double check that information to make sure we weren't just getting sold a bill of goods. Right, Rick? <laughs> Got to make fun of the sales guy, right? I'm an operations dude. All right. Exactly. So let's talk a little bit, of just a really brief timeline of, of how things got going uh, with the gateway. So uh, late October of 2015, we got board approval. Um, literally the next, that was on a Friday. On Monday, we were in Vegas eating pizza, having a good time, thinking we should get group tattoos, which thankfully we did not do. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some lessons learned here too. So first bullet point there says build, up, build out a team, right? And you're like, uh, duh, Eric, you probably need some people beyond the four of you to go figure out how to do this, right? Um, definitely the case. And that was one of our first early learnings, right? That the four of us were not going to be able to pull this off alone. Um, the really thing that was different for us is usually when Wells Fargo stands up a new initiative, we take a lot of people, smart people from Wells Fargo, bring them all together, maybe supplant them with a few managed resources, some contractor folks, right? But it's mainly Wells Fargo people driving this. We really looked at you know, our skill set across our technology group and said, you know what, we have some people that you know, are good with APIs. But we don't certainly have any experience with an API platform, et cetera. So we took a small group of Wells Fargo people this time and brought in lots of you know, resources uh, that, to help us out, you know, contractors and, and a lot of new employees. We went from having the four core of us to about 150 people in about six months, um, 125 at about the four-month mark. But one of the lessons learned that I would share with you if anybody's thinking about going down this path on your own is we didn't spend nearly enough time thinking about the cultural impact of bringing in lots of people that were not Wells Fargo people that didn't understand our culture, lots of non-financial services folks who didn't understand what it's like to work in a very heavily regulated business. And quite honestly, um, some people were super smart, but they couldn't work on a team. You know, we brought in these people that, you know, we thought would be really helpful to us to understand what's going on in the marketplace. And they did a great job with that. But at the same time, we needed to build something at the end. We couldn't have a thousand different voices singing different songs. And so we had to really step back from that a bit in, in about four or five months into it, go, okay, let's pause for a second. Let's get everybody on the same page and maybe change some of our hiring practices so that we, you know, weren't so distracted. Um, and then we also decided to go full-on Agile. So not just our API development squads and our integration squads and our platform squads, but all of our business process too. Wells Fargo is a big company, 275,000 people on the verge of trying to be Agile. We were one of the first groups uh, that I'm aware of. We tried to find other ones. We couldn't, either that or they didn't want to admit to it so they wouldn't uh, look bad for, you know, when we started asking them all these questions. But to do full-on business process Agile is very difficult in a waterfall organization. Um, getting people to understand that, hey, you know, our code review process can't happen after we get done building an API. We need that to happen while we're building the API. We need you guys to be integrated into all of our different processes that we have, not just waiting for things to happen in succession. So we've been struggling with that all along. I think, you know, we feel like we've got the moral high ground and we're beating down the rest of the bank. And, and I think they're kind of starting to see our, our viewpoint that when you do things together, you do them fast and you live the Agile manifesto, it's a much better process than, than doing things in a waterfall fashion. So we were also given a goal of you guys must launch your channel by the last day of September in 2016 with at least one API, and it'd be really great if you had a dev portal. 
We're like, okay, fine. You know, we, we took that challenge. So we all sat down and said, well, anybody can do one API. So we launched with five APIs and we launched the second to last day in September. So we all decided that we needed 5,000% added to our bonuses for being, you know, so aggressive. That didn't go over too well. No, nevertheless, we did launch with a Dev Portal 1.0. Um, very basic, you know, had all the functionality it needed for people to do an integration with us, but certainly didn't have all these great pictures that you see in this screenshot of our homepage of our Dev Portal 2.0. And if you go all the way to July 2018 today, so we're almost coming up on our two-year mark from when we went live, we've got hundreds of implementations now. We've got lots and lots of customers that are doing multiple API implementations. And we've launched now our Dev Portal 2.0 that, uh, as uh, the opener mentioned, we received a, an award with the Monarch Innovation Award a few months ago for our overall creativity and innovative approach to um, APIs. Yeah, thank you. Developer.wellsfargo.com. Um, you're certainly welcome to take a look at that. You know, you're, we are not a true open banking platform. We'll talk about that in a minute. So if you actually want access, you need to be a customer of ours, and we're happy to talk to you about being a customer if that's appropriate. Okay, just a couple of quick channel features and benefits. You know, we've got more than 20 plus APIs that are already in production. We have a variety of different style of APIs. We'll talk a little bit about business strategy in a coming upcoming slide. But we count our APIs differently. We don't count each resource within an API, an, an API like some companies do. We call an, an API for us would be like ACH, the entire breadth of resources that make that happen is an API. Um, one of the things that we knew that we'd heard over and over again from our customers and other types of products, one of them called Payment Manager, is the difficulty that people have implementing large-scale platforms you know, like APIs, like Payment Manager, et cetera, where there's lots of different components. We went out of our way from day one to make sure that it would be super easy for customers to actually integrate with us. Um, our quickest integration to date has been one day. You know, they run anywhere from one day to you know, a couple, three, four months, depending on the, the tech complexity, I guess, and also so the ability of the, the company that's doing the integration to be ready and to do their back-end work as well. But we certainly don't hold anybody up. Our, our stuff is very fast. You can see, it's probably a little hard to see here, but on our, our dev portal, really there's everything that a, that a developer needs. When we talk about customers for us, we're talking about developers. Anywhere from code snippets to Swagger documentation, and you can get your keys, you can register an application. Really, if somebody knows what they're doing, you need to have zero interaction with our support team to get set up. We're certainly you know, available for folks that want to have conversations and need some help. I've got my director of support here, Chandra Ramala. Raise your hand, Chandra, who's available for questions afterwards. But we've set it up on purpose, taking all the feedback we could from partner groups, from other customers, again, like I mentioned, that have gone down this path of having an API platform to really understand what does a person need to make this seamless, completely pain-free. And if you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't have to talk to anybody until you're ready to move to production. Of course, we're a bank. We have lots of layers of security, and it's one of the things that customers have come to us and said, hey, we've talked to other providers, other you know, companies that maybe aren't as sophisticated as Wells Fargo. Talk to me about your risk management and your security protocols. It was one of the things that we, I think we were really smart about at the beginning is we brought all of our information security folks, our risk management teams, brought them into our conversations early on, made sure that they had opportunities to talk to partners, talk to customers, like I mentioned before, that have gone down this path, and learn from each other to understand what does it mean to have a fully secure um, API platform. And our, our customers have been very thankful for that because it gives them that sense of, I know this may be new to me, but I know risk you know, has been thought about. I know that security has been well thought of. Um, the other thing that's different for us, we looked at a lot of developer portals, not just financial services developer portals, but telecom companies, um, software providers, et cetera. Basically, any developer portal we could find, we turned, uh, turned Chandra's support team loose on these things and said, okay, you guys are going to be supporting this you know, developer platform. What do you think looks good on these sites? You know, what, what drives you bananas, et cetera? And one of the things that we, I think we all agreed early on is it's very rare to have a developer you know, uh, portal where there's actually support people, real people. Usually it's, you know, you go in and fill out a form, somebody maybe gets back to you, even if you have a production issue, and you see, you'll get these responses, because we signed up for all these developer portals that we could. I'm like, oh, I'm having a, you know, a production problem. Oh, we'll get back to you in 72 hours. I'm like, well, in the banking world, you can't just go 72 hours without people having access to sending payments, to being able to receive payments, et cetera. So we staff our group 24 by 7, 365 days a year with live people that are developers in their own right. So Chandra's gone out and hired a whole team of people that can not only do development on their own, they wrote most of the code snippets that you find on our developer site. So 
they know all this stuff very intimately and it really allows for our customers to walk away if they do contact us with one touch resolution, almost in 90 plus percent of the, the cases. So that's, that's us, us. Channel, channel features and benefits, and benefits kind of how we got to where we're at today. today. Um, let's, let's move on and talk a little bit about what's going on in the industry, industry right? right? API growth is off the charts. Um, I mentioned sure early on that as a, a big bank, bank, we were, were the first, first you know, bank to launch an API channel. channel. Um, some of the folks you see over here on the right side of, the, of this chart is banking as a service, right? In our parlance at Wells Fargo, we think of that as kind of what fintech companies generally provide, right? They've thought of a, a, a way to, to meet a need, um, might be a niche need, it might be a broader need, but it, it kind of focus on one thing. Um, that's great. We partner with a lot of fintech companies and we're doing more, so we've even created a special banking group down in the Valley to make sure that we're in, in the same, you know, General, general areas, areas where these companies are having meetings so that we can collaborate with them very easily. We also think of some of our APIs as banking as a service, where we're providing a specific function. I mentioned earlier ACH, we'll talk about that again in a minute. That's a function, right? Wells Fargo is the largest provider of ACH in the country. That's a banking as a service opportunity for us to work with customers. Open banking, which is you know kind of the all the rage nowadays in, in Europe when you think about PSD2 and whatnot, right, of being able to provide APIs that developers can come in and use you know, to develop things on their own for perhaps their own purposes for a small company or even for a larger company. We are certainly interested in those opportunities as well and we've got some partnerships right now that you know, really have come in. You know, we sometimes think of this as our federated model where a, a developer company wants to come in and develop an application that maybe we use as Wells Fargo or maybe they're going to use powered by our APIs. We definitely think of ourselves as a channel and as a distribution channel, as I mentioned before, which means that we're covering the full spectrum of API opportunities. We're not limiting ourselves to just being one or the other. Um, it makes us a little bit different than pretty much everybody other than Silicon Valley Bank in city to a certain extent. But we're, you know, we're quite honestly, our, our little orange circle there is indicative of our size. We're still right now the, the biggest provider of APIs during, through an API channel. Okay, so some business strategy. Some, we really kind of thought about, you know, what's our place in the world? Where do we think, you know, we belong when it comes to API opportunities? And we've really kind of honed in on, on these three things, the three Ps as we like to call them. And really the first one is, is pretty straightforward and where we started quite honestly was creating API products for wholesale customers, APIs that are, you know, data service driven and that are transactionally, you know, thoughtful. So we're, when we say transactions for us, that's ACH wires, foreign exchange, things like that. Data services become account aggregation and a host of other things that we provide, making appointment opportunities, things like that. Our partner category, this is you know, something that we, we really find a lot of value in and I think where the industry ultimately is going. A lot of times we think of that first P as, in a sense, replacement technology, right? You know, there's lots of ways if you contact Wells Fargo that you can make an ACH payment. A lot of ways that you can make a wire payment. What we're looking at now is going back to that ERP mentality, right? The Lawson's, the Oracle software companies, right? The companies will buy into so they can process all their, you know, accounts payable, accounts receivable, even do some HR stuff on that. But, but we're, we're looking, looking at those guys, guys saying, you know what, at some point in time, customers, especially large corporate customers, are going to want to integrate our APIs into those platforms so that as they're doing all their other account reconciliation business, they could start making payments from that platform. They won't have to leave that platform to go somewhere else. So if you go back to that distribution net, right, today we've got a really great suite of products hosted on our consumer electronic office channel, but that requires customers to leave their ERP and go out and do things there. We then transmit information back to that ERP. What if you could just do it all in the same place? So there's integrations like that that we're looking at. I think Tyler talked about that in his keynote on Monday. Integration with APIs is definitely the wave of the future, especially for large corporate customers. And, and the last one, the, the powered by, everybody, everybody talks, talks about, you know, an experience being powered by something. By something. We're, We're probably no different glomming onto that same mentality that there are certainly, there are certainly APIs that we want to look at as a, a comprehensive whole that, you know, could a vendor come in, for example, and say, you know what, I, I have lots of need for a banking services, but I don't want to use an ERP that exists today. Maybe I want to build my own experience. We want to be able to support all that and power that experience for them with our Wells Fargo APIs. Um, another example, this would be, you know, right now, all of our mortgage applications are running through an application that was built by a third-party company that's using our APIs. We're hosting that. They developed it all. We didn't really do much of that API development, again, using that federated model, realizing that, yes, we can build all the APIs that the company wants, but it's sometimes better to let the people who intimately know their business develop their own APIs using our federated standards and our security and risk protocols. 
that's, that's kind of where, where we see ourselves today. today is, and, and you know, again, again we're two, barely two years into this, you know, uh, since, since we got, got going, going originally. originally. The strategy, I'm sure, will continue to evolve. You've probably heard or maybe intimated through my comments that, you know, we're really only dealing with existing customers of Wells Fargo, right? If you want access to our developer portal, you need to be a customer of ours. You could be a prospect, but we're not an open banking platform. We don't just let anybody in and take a look at our stuff. And, and we've kind of made a conscious decision to do that, right? We talked to lots of, of, of different you know, customers, again, um, that had done this before, and they're like, you know, this whole notion of like the individual developer, that's probably not your guys' space right now, right? Right now you're thinking about the products that you have offered through APIs as being things that you need to have approval to use, right? If you want to be an ACH user at Wells Fargo, you need to be approved to use that product, right? And we don't approve individual users to use our ACH product, right? You have to be a wholesale customer, meaning a, a you know, bank customer that is you know, a business. So for now, we've decided that our, our, our plan is to stick with our wholesale and large retail customer bases. At some point in time, I think we'll take a look at does it make sense sense for us in the spirit of partner empowered by to really open up our platform to individual developers and see what value they can bring to us at the same time not draining Chandra's team of resources and time you know and because we, we've got a little experience with this of you know oh hey I've got this really awesome you know API opportunity for Steve's hairdressing company down the street I think we'll send you like six API calls a year you know but I need like 400 hours of your developer time like yeah, probably, probably not, not the best, best use right, right now. So, so as we continue to get, you know, um, more experience with our customers and kind of see how integrations work and go down these paths further, and we'll open up to more and more as we go along. It's a constantly evolving, you know, strategy that, you know, again, is trying to be where the puck will be, right? Meaning we want to be where the, the industry is moving before it gets there. Okay. Let's, Let's talk, talk about a couple different, different uh, use cases, cases that we have available right now. I kind, kind of alluded to this one earlier, account aggregation. So, so one of the things that, that you know, when we're thinking about digital strategy where we're working with our digital team on a daily basis is looking at how they're developing tools and technology to help our customers make smarter, better informed decisions. Account aggregation is one of these, right? So what this means to us is that, you know, if you sign up for an account aggregation site and you're like, oh, I want, you know, my Wells Fargo checking account information to go over there to this site. I've got a, an account at some other bank. I want that to come in. I've got an insurance thing over here. Account aggregation is great. It makes financial literacy something, you know, that's easier for people to understand. They don't have to go to a bunch of different static sites to get their information. One of the things that we've always been challenged with at Wells Fargo, though, is the fact that in order for your information to flow to those sites until recently, you basically had to break your contractual agreement with us or your user agreement and give up your username and password to an account aggregation site. We were like, uh, you know, we don't know anything about these companies, their security protocols. You've now given them access to everything. Maybe you only wanted them to have access to your checking account. If you're like me, of course you have your joint checking account with your wife or your spouse or partner, then you have your secret accounts, right? The ones that you know you save money for for you know the guys' trips. Hey, I want a motorcycle next year, so I'm saving up, right? The last thing you want is all that stuff going to your account aggregator site. So I mean, maybe people don't think like me, but you know that's me. Um, what, what we, we said, said, okay, well, well rather, rather than you customer giving up your information to this account aggregation site, what if we built a series of APIs where we can deliver your account information using our secure APIs over rails that we know and can understand and monitor and, and watch for breaches versus some other arrangement with a company that we don't have any information about? Wouldn't that be much better? And I think the account aggregators have finally come on board with us that that's a better setup. Certainly the regulators like it better that way. But we've taken this a step further with, with a new product that we launched called Control Tower. Tower. So, so a customer of Wells Fargo can log into to wellsfargo.com and they can select what information they want to send to these account aggregators. So if you only want to send you know, your public accounts and not your private accounts, you can click that and that information is all that will be sent. If you decide at some point in time that you no longer want to use that account aggregation site or maybe you're switching to a different one or whatever, you can go back to that wellsfargo.com site and just turn it off. You, you don't, don't have, have to go, go worry about, about you know, remembering a password for another site and then remembering to turn all that stuff off. You know, the, the other thing that's nice with this too is that all that other information that they've been screen scraping every time they pop onto your site, you know, that's no longer theirs to have. You're in full control of the information that you're sharing. We think that's better for everyone. All right, so uh, ACH, as I mentioned before, ACH is our number one, or we're the number one provider of ACH um, all across the country. Uh, you, you can tell, tell from the, the, these three people here that they are so enamored with our ACH API that they just literally cannot tear their eyes from the screen, right? 
So, so we make fun of this a little bit, but you know, ACH, ACH is a huge part of our digital economy today, today right? There's, there's just billions and billions of dollars running across these rails all the time. You know, our, our customer type, type for this, you know, API is pretty, pretty straightforward. Wholesale, wholesale customers paying vendors, paying their employees, debiting consumers for bills, e-commerce, etc. We've built all of our transactional APIs, including ACH, with the idea that they can be reused. So one customer will, you know, say, I just want to integrate directly. I want to be able to make and receive ACH payments. Others might say, well, I want to make that, that part, part of another, another experience, experience that I'm building, building. We, we can, can literally, literally move from experience to experience to experience, to experience. Most, uh, most if not all the time, with very little change to the resources that are underlying the API itself so that it's quickly um, able to be used somewhere else. Big, big time importance for us, even though it's a fairly esoteric thing, but it is um, something that customers have asked us for over and over again. All right, and then, and then the last uh, example, example that I'll share with you is foreign exchange. exchange. This, this is actually one of my favorite ones because this is a great example of how APIs can be reused. And this is probably a little bit hard to, to read, but here you've got somebody um, on their tablet, a wholesale customer, using a, you know, an ERP system. This, this happens to be a fake one we came up with called Cloud ERP. But this is a great company. I, I probably should want to own this company myself, but it's a winery. Um, I'm a big fan of wine and anything that having to do with wine. In this case, they're buying some premium French oak barrel and anybody that knows anything about wine production knows that that's the number one choice for barrels. They're also extraordinarily expensive. Um, and this is actually fairly um, on mark for a relatively small barrel, about 4,200 euros. Um, hard to believe, right? A couple pieces of wood could cost that much money. In this case, we're buying 100 of them because we obviously have, you know, grown a lot of grapes this year and have a lot of wines to get going on. But right away, you can say, okay, I need to pay this bill and the customer wants me to pay it in euros. So... Not, Not only can I do that, that, I can click the little button that says get FX quote. I can see what the exchange rates are. I can book that contract and actually make it happen all with you know ERPs within that. I'm sorry, all with APIs within that ERP without ever having to, to leave. You can do that in, in a mere fraction of seconds. How awesome is that? So that's a wholesale use case. Think about a retail use case. This is one of my favorite. So kind of, you know, following on with this whole wine barrel theme. Well, geez, I'm super intrigued now. Maybe I wasn't really a wine person before, but geez, you know, this, these wine barrels cost a lot of money. I mean, that wine must be good, right? Otherwise, people wouldn't be spending all this money just on the barrel to make it taste better. Maybe I should go over to France and see some of this for myself, right? So you get done working, you hop on your, you're on your pad anyways, you hop over to a travel site, and you're like, I'm going to France. So, so you're booking your ticket, ticket get done with all that, that. using, using some Wells Fargo or artificial intelligence that you know we've got built into the background, right? Boy, maybe that you know we know that you're now thinking about going to France. Don't you need some euros? Wouldn't it be cool in that experience if you could just click a button and said, "Yep, I also need some euros. I'm a Wells Fargo customer. Debit my account, and I can choose do I want them sent to a nearby branch to pick up if that's convenient for me, or maybe even to my house." So when we think about distribution all the way back to the beginning. That's where our brain is going as well as Fargo is not how many more static environments can we can we build? How many just standalone or, or APIs can we build that people can integrate? It's thinking about those daily transactions all that time, right? Those four hours a day that we're all spending online. How can we start wickering in financial decisions that people know they need to make and make them super convenient for them so that while you're in the moment, you can think of everything all together, right? Because, you know, like I'm sure like the rest of you, you, you know, I'm thinking about going someplace, I got to stop the mail, I got to get this, I got to do that. That. If, if you could do all these things in just one contextual experience, experience it makes your life a whole lot easier. Um, same, same thing if you go back to ACH, right? One of my, my favorites is I was talking to my daughter. I'm sure anybody that has a kid in college knows that no conversation with a college kid doesn't include, I need money, right? So if you're thinking about maybe you're on an IM exchange you know, with this person who is supposedly in their mind financially independent, but I guess that means something different if you're the parent of said supposedly financially independent person. If we use all that AI that says, hey, I see you're you know, IMing with Grace. I'm kind of making this up, right? But not completely. Uh, we see you're talking with Grace. Every time you talk to Grace, you magically end up sending her 100 bucks or 200 bucks. Here's your current balance. What would, what would you like to send her this time? And, and riding the rails of Venmo or Zelle or whatever, right? We can now help you make those decisions and get that money earlier. And of course, then Grace can say, hey, remember every time we have this chat conversation, you just send me money anyways, so can you just skip to that part? So we're making people's lives richer, if you will, by embedding financial services in the moment where they're at. Back to that delivering products and services where a customer is, not making them come to us. So 
We've, we've got, got a little bit of time, time left. Um, um, that kind of is the end of my formal, formal comments. So um, we've, we've got, got about 10 minutes, give or take. So I thought maybe we'd open it up and see if anybody has any questions that I can answer. And I refuse to write to not answer your question if it's too specific about things that are secret to Wells Fargo. Fair enough? All right. Anybody have any questions? Oh, way over there. Yep. Banks uh, adopting that uh, standard more and more in the future. Do you think that that will happen? Um, I, th I think it's probably inevitable in some form or fashion that we'll see aspects of PSD2 come over. I, I think the thing that, you know, I was talking to Tyler earlier today and Rick as well, we're uh, actually meeting with some regulators this Thursday to talk a little bit about the future of banking and where things are going, and I'm sure that'll be a topic of conversation. I think we've seen the writing on the wall at Wells Fargo and are already doing things like Control Tower, as I mentioned. That's clearly you know, going, going down, down the path of PSD2 and, and allowing customers to have more choice about where their information is going and how frequently it goes there. I think what we need to understand, you know, from a large U.S. bank presence is how do we make things available, to information and, and transactional services available to people and still keep it secure? Because we go back to that notion of individual developer who maybe wants to, you know, I want access to my data. You know, I've, we've heard that, you know, with people trying to register for our, our, de de our de uh, if I can talk, developer portal. But, you know, they're not really ready, right? They're, yes, they're in intrigued by the idea that if I could have access to my information, maybe I could do something with it. We need to make sure that they're doing that in, in a truly um, secure and risk management approach manner because they're not thinking about that, right? Just give me my information, I'll figure it out. But as soon as somebody hacks their account and drains all their money out, who do you think they're going to come calling, right? So we're trying to be thoughtful about this and make sure that whatever we're doing, we're guiding the regulators with lessons learned about, you know, our, some of our experiences, and they've been very willing to listen to that. Hmm? Hey, thanks, thanks for the great presentation. presentation. Uh, I had a two-part two part question. question. Uh, first, first one is, what is your APA business model and pricing? The second, second part is, if any developer, developer want to come and sign up, um, do you, is that there any cost for them, them or you support, support them with sandbox tenants? Okay, okay. so, so I, I heard two. Let me see if I, I captured them correctly. What's our pricing strategy? strategy? Uh, none, none of your business. business. Just, just kidding. kidding. <laughs> um, so we've, we've got, you know, Wells Fargo is obviously, you know, a very complex, you know, company with lots of different customer relationships. So our pricing strategy is different depending on the line of business that we interact with. Each one of our lines of business come up with their own pricing strategy that's reflective of the complexity of the API, how much volume we think they're going to run through our channel, and the overall value of that, you know, API. So something like an ACH, right? I mean, that's a relatively low cost, you know, um, rail for us to ride to begin with. So that's going to have a different pricing strategy than something that's more complex that we maybe have built, you know, as a, a standalone API for a customer to handle one specific need that they have. So it depends upon the relationship. And, and the, the second, second part, part do we, I wasn't, wasn't quite sure, do we charge uh, for access? Yes, yeah, so any developers want to sign up, how do you mm -hmm. go about doing that? Yep, yep. So, so we don't charge anything for access to our developer portal, but, but you, you do have to be a customer or a prospect of ours, right? So if you just went out there today and said, hey, you know, uh, I want to log on, you know, contact us for more information, and you're not a customer of ours, that's, that's going to go to Chandra's team, and Chandra's team is going to politely decline your request and refer you to one of our relationship managers to see if a business relationship makes sense, and then you can become a customer. But once you're a prospect or a customer, we give you know we go through the a little know your customer kind of approach, to make sure you are who we think you are, and then you have access to the dev portal, and you can do all the testing and sandbox you want. There's no charge for any of that. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Can, Can you comment, comment on, on how you use the public, public cloud versus the private cloud and maybe a managed cloud in the context of the API economy you talked about? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, today our, our hosting of our API channel is not in the cloud. We're moving to that later this year. Definitely was, will be a private cloud experience. Um, and it's something we don't talk a whole lot about yet because it's still kind of building out for us, but definitely the wave of the future, right, when you think about um, speed, capacity, the ability to, to host a large amount of volume through a channel like ours, we definitely want to take and you know, make use of a cloud environment so that we can manage massive amounts of volume without having to build up, you know, monster, you know, data centers with lots of VMs, etc. So it's definitely part of our strategy. All right. Lots of questions. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious if you use your, uh, if your company uses the APIs internally or if you have any plans to move in that direction. 
Um, yeah, great question. So um, my presentation covered what, what we call, so there's a vernacular right in this world, right? So we consider our channel the API gateway, which means it's customer facing, outward facing. We do have a sister group within our overall API strategy, and we call that the microservices group that is building internal APIs so that one, we can connect to those microservices with our APIs and make our you know, processing speed faster, but also to be able to connect systems back and forth that historically you know, were very challenged to talk to each other, required tons and tons of coding you know, to bridge between these you know, systems that, again, were developed back in the good old days of own it, you know, or run it like you own it, and a lot of times, you know, code that no one else understood, et cetera. So we've, we've actually invested quite a bit of energy in, uh, in the last year and a half on our microservices strategy. So we're uh, connected with them on a daily basis. So they're building out their, you know, their services based on the APIs that we're building. They're also going beyond that, building out services in advance of where our APIs are even going so that we'll be ready to integrate those using a microservices strategy down the road. Anyone else? Uh-oh, here it comes. Yes, WSO2 is a great partner. Did I get ahead of your question? Yeah. How'd you guess? <laughs> No, thank you very much for this uh, excellent, outstanding presentation. I really appreciate it. I think we all really appreciate it, Eric. Um, and this may be, I, I don't know if this is going to uh, direct you to some proprietary information. It is. If we'll find it is, out. I'm sure you'll say, say uh, one way or another. So you talked about account aggregation. And I think that uh, some of your APIs are, are being exposed to some of the traditional aggregators, such as Yodli and, and Mint and, and others. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about how that works. Uh, about how the actual APIs work? Or? Well. You, you talked, talked about sort of uh, Wells Fargo controlling that experience as mm -hmm. opposed to sort of outsourcing that experience to something like a Mint. So I guess I was just kind of curious about how you do that. Sure. Yeah. So we, we certainly don't want to disrupt the account aggregation world. That's not our plan. Right? And it goes back to, you know, if the core values of Wells Fargo is that we want to help people succeed financially. And we realize that, you know, not everybody has every account, you know, known to mankind that is financially oriented with Wells Fargo. It, you know, makes sense in a lot of cases for people to, to use other services as well. So what we've decided is that, you know, Early on, there was a, certainly a lot of conversation about, do we just completely disrupt that industry and try to come out with something on our own? And, and I think what we realized is that that's probably not going to work anyways. And really, these you know, account aggregators, and we've had some press releases about this already, so it's somewhat fair to talk about with Mint.com and Zero, et cetera, that how about we just become better partners? And I think that's really the difference that Wells Fargo has taken, that it's okay to have companies out there disrupting the financial world. As long as we have the mentality that we want to be there and develop with them, we're not going to be that you know, defensive posturing that you used to see a lot of times from the big banks saying, nope, they're wrong, we're right, and we're going to try to you know, keep them from, in a sense, getting inside our gates. How about we let them inside our gates facilitated by us and co-develop stuff? And that's the approach that we took with our account aggregation API suite, which is to say, you know, we're going to help customers Customers control the information using Control Tower, which says what information will be sent to that aggregator using our APIs instead of them grabbing whatever they want through a screen scraping approach. So I think they were surprised that you know we had this approach that we weren't just trying to shut them down and kind of keep them out of business because we find value in that approach, right? If somebody feels that they can manage their finances better by having all their information from lots of providers under one roof, great. We certainly don't want to get in the middle of that. We want to encourage financial literacy. So that's been our approach is to be partner oriented and to really work with the aggregators to say, let's continue to, to let you have information, but only the information that customers directly want you to have, not everything else that you've been scraping along the way. So, yeah, thanks. Um, question for you, uh, I'm trying to form it properly, but um, how do you determine what to expose, you know, what APIs to create? Is that Mm -hmm. Determined by line of business, uh, do you determine and what model would you suggest sure. to other people thinking about exposing their APIs and, and having an API driven business for them? Where do you go to start to determine which are the right ones, how granular they should be, and like what the business case is for them? Yeah, that's actually a fantastic question, one that we've been um, thought a lot about, we continue to think a lot about. Um, 
going back to maybe like even a lessons learned thing, when we, we started with our five APIs, right? We as the gateway made a conscious decision. These are the five APIs that we're going to launch with. Um, some of that was because some work had already been done on those. ACH is one of those first five, so it was foreign exchange. And some of that was also us saying as the channel, we need to do the right thing by the company, which is to build out certain APIs whether or not a line of business wants to perhaps you know, fund that on their own or develop it on their own. We just know that we're going to need these APIs to make the channel succeed. However, we are also having conversations with all of our line of business partners to say, start thinking about changing your, your process for you know, product development, right? And this is the lesson learned thing, right? Is you got to get in early and start talking with those traditional product managers, right? In, in a couple jobs ago that I had at Wells Fargo, I used to manage our commercial credit card platform on, on the operations and in, in non-sales side of the business. And one of the things that was so frustrating is, right, we would get recommendations for product enhancements and we'd all, you know, yes, we must do this, right? Got to have it. 18 months later, we might have it. Right? right? Because, because of all the time it took to do research, research development, development, Java coding, blah, blah, blah. You're like, you know, you know what? But, but if that's what your product team knows and has learned because they've been in that role for a really long time, you're going to have to get in there early and start making API evangelists out of these people, right? Because we come in and say, hey, we're going to build your API. You know, we run two-week sprints. You know, we might need four or five sprints for this thing. And they're like, no, no way. There's, There's no, no way, way you can build that as fast as you say you can. can. And, and then, then we prove to them that, that we can, and they're like, oh my goodness, now, now you know, now what do I do, right? Because this is the other side of it. I'm not ready to go to market yet because I thought I had 18 months. You know, I have no sales training in place, right? So get in early with those product managers and get them to start thinking about how fast they can actually get this stuff to market. And the fact that you can then, you know, if you decide that whatever you launched doesn't really fit the full needs of your customer, we can change that really quickly. And better yet, how about you bring a customer to us and we'll co-develop it. Right? And, and I, I think, think that's, that's really, really truly the power of an API platform, platform is that co-development piece. We've, We've done that several times now with customers. We're like, you know what? You guys are tech savvy. We're obviously tech savvy. Why don't you just, let's get together. We'll do an MVP. You know, maybe even after a sprint, we can drop something in our sandbox, see if that works. You know, if not, iterate on that. And then, you know, in a couple sprints later, you're back to the marketplace with a live product making money. And I think that's at the end of the day what we all want, making customers happy and making money. Power of APIs is probably summed up there. But get in early with all these partners and make sure they understand not just the risk and compliance people, but even for us, our, we've had a really tough time trying to convince some of these product managers that it can be done this fast. And when we show them, it's like, they're literally wowed. And it takes them a while to kind of digest how they can ditch their old school waterfall product management you know, ideas and turn that into an agile environment. Great question. Thanks. And I think that puts us over for time. So thanks very much.